Thank you all for being here today, um, for joining us for our 2015-2016 kickoff event. Um, something that's special to note is that um, this fall marks the 20th anniversary of Lunch Poems, so we're really happy to have you here with us. First off, I'd like to invite you all to sign up for our email list. It's right over there on the librarian's desk. You can also find um, copies of our entire complete program for 2015-2016, so feel free to grab one if you'd like. Um, on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, you can find this reading and past readings as well in webcast and video format. Um, next month, October 1st, um, we invite you to join us for a reading by John Shopta. He's professor of English here and author of the 2015 Notre Dame Book Prize, um, a book of poetry, Time Speech. Um, in the meantime, if you would like some fiction in your life, please check out our sister program, Story Hour, which will be happening next week, uh, September 10th at 5 p.m. here in the Morrison Library. And now please help me welcome Robert Haas, Director of Lunch Poems, who will introduce today's readers. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for all your work. It is 20 years uh, that this program has been going on in this library, and this, this first month's reading is the sweetest of it to hear these many voices. We're very grateful to the readers who've agreed to come today. And just to make sure that you're not nervous about this, I want to let you know that this is being recorded and that, <laughs> and that the Lunch Poems readings have received three and a half million hits in 20 years on the, on the uh, people love to hear these things. Um, and I, and I also do want to come, encourage you to come this year to the readings. It's every, every first Thursday of the month. Um, among the readers are John Shoptaw from here, who grew up on a, on a bend of the Mississippi River that got left behind, after, stayed in the Depression basically into the 1980s. And he's written a spectacular first book of poetry about about the um, about that world, the, it's as if I was writing about it. I said it's as if Hart Crane met James Agee uh, in these poems. And Greg Pardlow, a young African American poet, who just won the Pulitzer Prize in poetry, is going to be reading. And an experimental filmmaker and poet, Korean American woman from Seattle, who won the Walt Whitman Prize, is going to be. So anyway, it's a very exciting set of readings as this is today. Um, particularly honored to have Janica Bockley here. She's, uh, as you know, the first lady of our <laughs> campus, uh, which probably means she has to socialize way too many evenings for our good. Thank you for that. Um, she specializes in modern South Asian history. Her areas of specialization include Indian political history, Indian feminist history, nationalism, gender, and culture. Her first book, Two Men in Music, Nationalism, Colonialism, and the Making of the Indian Classical Tradition was published by Oxford University Press, not bad, in 2005. Her current book, Project, is about sedition, colonial surveillance, and the emergence pressing topic at the moment, the emergence of Hindu fundamentalism in the late 19th century. She's already been such a powerful and graceful presence on our campus. Please welcome her. Well, thank you, Bob. That was an introduction I wasn't expecting to get. I was expecting you know, I'm a faculty member in the Department of History. Um, so about a week ago, I had a whole set of poems that I was choosing from. Um, and then I had to put them aside. And I put them aside. I'll be very brief in my introduction of why it is that I'm reading the poem I'm reading. I went to Iowa. My husband's sister-in-law, and in my tradition, that would be my sister-in-law. Um, had battled cancer for about eight years, and had, uh, and she passed away a week ago. And I was able to see her um, in her hospital room before she passed. And uh, she was a farmer, or in Iowa, in, in Wellsburg, Iowa, which is north and east of Des Moines. 
She would, call, she would have called herself a farm wife. Her name was Billy Jansen. And she had a hard life, um, but it was a beautiful life for her. And what made her happiest was sitting in her kitchen and looking out at the corn as it grew before it harvested. I couldn't read this poem at her funeral. I couldn't make it back. And so with apologies to all of you for setting a slightly somber note, this poem is for Billy. This was what one of her days would have been like. It's a poem by Hausman, A.E. Hausman. And here we are. Yonder see the morning blink. The sun is up and up must I to wash and dress and eat and drink and look at things and talk and think and work and God knows why. Oh, often have I washed and dressed and what's to show for all my pain? Let me lie abed and rest. 10,000 times I've done my best and all's to do again. How clear, how lovely bright, how beautiful to sight those beams of morning play. How heaven laughs out with glee, where, like a bird set free, up from the eastern sea, soars the delightful day. Today I shall be strong, no more shall yield to wrong, shall squander life no more. Days lost, I know not how, I shall retrieve them now. Now I shall keep the vow I never kept before. And sanguining the skies, how heavily it dies into the west away. Past touch and sight and sound, not further to be found, how hopeless underground falls the remorseful day. Thank you. Thank you, gorgeous and surprising. I just happened to be reading the letters of Willa Cather this summer. And as a young woman, she finally got an assignment with McClure's Magazine to go to England. She was going to write the great novels about Midwestern farm wives. And when they asked her what she wanted to do, she said, I want to go to Shropshire and drink in a pub where Hausman drank and breathe his air. <laughs> so the connection there. Um, and speaking of connection, our next reader is Ken Ueno. He's an associate professor of music. Um, he's a winner of the Rome Prize and the Berlin Prize, and a composer, vocalist, sound artist, who is currently, uh, I've already told you, he's already an associate professor here. He regularly collaborates with some of the greatest musicians in the world, including Eighth Blackbird and the Hilliard Ensemble. He holds a PhD from Harvard, and his bio appears in the Grove Dictionary of American Music. It seems to me an artist of endless imagination and fertility. It's such a pleasure to introduce him to you today. Ken. Wow, thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor to be here and to be invited to read uh, one of my favorite um, pieces of poetry. And um, I hope I'm not embarrassing you by reading one of your works. <laughs> uh, I am a fan. We had a shared event in the fall. And uh, we had a, it was a great um, moment for me uh, to finally get an opportunity to meet you then. And so this is doubly uh, a great honor to um, um, uh, engage with you again today and have the special honor to read uh, uh, one of my favorite pieces of yours. <clears throat> um, your work has been quite um, inspiring to me in many ways. Uh, when you say things like sometimes the body is as numinous as words or when you say one of the first things poetry is is a physical structure of the actual breath of a given emotion. These bits of wisdom have uh, made me think about uh, my relationship to breath and words and sounds and my vocal practice as well as, um, as a composer. And being a composer and being Japanese, I thought um, 
about your poem, a story about the body, in which you have two characters who, who are one being a composer and one a Japanese woman. A story about the body. The young composer working that summer at an artist's colony had watched her for a week. She was Japanese, a painter almost 60, and he thought he was in love with her. He loved her work, and her work was like the way she moved her body, used her hands, looked at him directly when she mused and considered answers to his questions. One night, walking back from a concert, they came to her door and she turned to him and said, I think you would like to have me. I would like that too, but I must tell you that I've had a double mastectomy. And when he didn't understand, I've lost both my breasts. The radiance that he had carried around in his belly and chest cavity like music withered quickly. And he made himself look at her when he said, I'm sorry, I don't think I could. He walked back to his own cabin through the pines, and in the morning he found a small blue bowl on the porch outside his door. It looked to be full of rose petals, but he found when he picked it up that the rose petals were on top. The rest of the bowl, she must have swept the corners of her studio, was full of dead bees. Well, thank you, and thank you for reading that so beautifully, but what a dark poem to read. So our next reader is my neighbor, uh, Joan Bader. She's a professor in the School of Journalism, specializing in video, and at the moment she's associate d dean of the graduate school, which means she does all the hard work that allows the rest of us to teach and play. Um, Joan uh, uh, has taught video reporting, producing, writing, and storytelling for 25 years at Cal and 10 years at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, sending her students all over the world to report and produce video stories of interest and importance. She's the author of a book on the history of Singapore Jewry titled The Jews of Singapore. Joan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Bob. Um, as I said to Dave and Bob, I, I declined the offer last year because I was too nervous to get up and do this, but asked to be re recalled, and um, now I'm happy that they did think to recall me. Um, this, is comes out, this poem comes out of a or my decision to do this poem comes out of a personal experience. Before I came to Berkeley, I spent a month each summer for 10 years in Aix-les-Bains, a small spa town in the Savoie region of France, very near uh, Lac de Bourget, Bourget Lake, Lake Bourget, uh, whose healing waters have been known at least since Roman times. I took um, uh, the treatment there known as the cure um, which contributed enormously to alleviating my poor health at the time. Now here's another introduction <clears throat> to this love poem. In 1816, in Aix-les-Bains, near the Lake Bourget, Lamartine met Julie Charles, the wife of a prominent Parisian, an intelligent woman, by many accounts, who suffered from a respiratory illness. When he returned the following year to continue their liaison, he learned that she had died. He based his most famous poem, The Lake, on their short relationship. This is the poem. O lake, scarce has a single year coursed past. To waves that she was meant to see again, I come alone to sit upon this stone you saw her sit on then. 
Recall the evening we sailed out in silence on waves beneath the skies afar and wide, naught but the rowers' rhythmic oars we heard stroking your tuneful tide. Then of a sudden tones untold on earth resounded round the sounding spelling, spellbound sea. The tide attended, and I heard these words from the voice dear to me. Pause in your track, O time. Pause in your flight, favorable hours, and stay. Let us enjoy the transient delight that fills our fairest day. Unhappy crowds cry out to you in prayers. Flow time and set them free. Run through their days and through their ravening cares, but leave the happy be. In vain I pray the hours to linger on and time slips into flight. I tell this night, be slower, and the dawn undoes the raveled night. Let's love then. Love and feel while feel we can the moment on its run. There is no shore of time, no port of man. It flows and we go on. Covetous time, our mighty drunken moments when love pours forth huge floods of happiness. Can it be true that they depart no faster than days of wretchedness? O oh, lake, caves, silent cliffs, and darkling wood, whom time has spared or can restore to light. Beautiful nature, let there live at least the memory of that night. Let it be in your stills and in your storms, fair lake, in your cavorting sloping sides, in the black pine trees, in the savage rocks that hang above your tides. Let it be in the breeze that stirs and passes, in sounds resounding shore to shore each night, in the star's silver countenance that glances your surface with soft light. Let the deep keening winds, the sighing reeds, let the light balm you blow through cliff and grove, let all that is beheld or heard or breathed say only they did love. That's the poem. Thank you, Joan. Gorgeous. Um, these readings, the lunch hours readings and the story hour readings happen because they're sponsored by the uh, library, to, and the person who's made it happen for 20 years is Dave Dewar, who's been indefatigable about bringing a vivid cultural life into the library for the students and the staff of the campus. He's going to introduce the rest of the readers. Please welcome Dave Dewar. You like introductions. That was good. In, in the, infatigable. I, yeah. <laughs> something I try. Something. I do want you to know, as Bob slips out for his class, and Ken will have to soon, too, um, that we will, at some point in spring term, be celebrating the 20th uh, season in a spe very special way. And you will hear about it. But uh, we've already lined up a few very special people to join us and uh, come back from uh, whence, they, whence they are. Uh, and uh, if they read before, many of them have, we'll have them returning. So stay tuned. Um, Nadia Ellis, who's also in the English department and shares Bob's department, uh, is associate professor of English at, here at UC Berkeley. She teaches courses on black and post-colonial literatures. Her book on conceptual belonging in the African diaspora, Territories of the Soul, will be published this fall. Welcome, Nadia. There is a really forbidding sign here that says mouth 10 inches from mic. Yes. So one must measure. Does that look right? Yeah? <laughs> Take off my shoes. <laughs> Does that sound right? OK, great. Thank you. I'm so happy to be there. I'm, I'm very honored and very happy. And I'm going to read a poem by Lorna Goodison. And I have two things to say about it before I read. Lorna Goodison is a Jamaican writer. She was born in 1947. And she came from the hills above the neighborhood that I grew up in. And so I was surrounded by the Blue Mountains. And they were magisterial and lush and also incredibly familiar. 
And I feel like Lorna Goodison embodied all of that. She's incredibly magisterial. She's very, very lush. She's quite tall. But then strangely, because this is what it means to live in a smaller country, I have a few, I've had a few run-ins with her. And one of the things I remembered was that when I was in high school, for some reason I was filming a remedial math video. <laughs> and one of the things that Lorna Goodison was doing before she became this incredibly eminent and very, very prominent writer in Jamaica was directing these remedial math videos. And so I remember going to a studio and seeing this woman, and I, she'd already published work. This selection of her poetry was just about to come out. I hadn't read it yet. But I just remember somebody very, very forbidding from the hills uh, telling me to sit properly and to comb my hair because it was messing up the shot. <laughs> and then I went to university and I read this book. And this particular volume, the one I have in my hands, is the one that I read. And um, she was a great favorite of mine. The second thing I'll say is the title of the poem is I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart which shall not be put out. And that title is from um, the Apocrypha of the Bible, from two Edras. And I want, to read, <laughs> I want to read the full verse that it comes from. And come hither, this verse says, and come hither and I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart, which shall not be put out, till the things be performed, which thou shalt begin to write. And I feel like at the beginning of the semester, I need both understanding and a prompt <laughs> to write. <laughs> And maybe you all do too. I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart which shall not be put out. I shall light. First, debts to pay and fences to mend, lay to rest the wounded past, foes disguised as friends. I shall light a candle of understanding. Cease the training of impossible hedges round this life, for as fast as you sow them, Serendipity's thickets will appear and outgrow them. I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart. All things in their place, then, in this many-chambered heart. For each thing a place, and for him a place apart. I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart, which shall not be put out. By the hand that lit the candle, by the never-to-be-extinguished flame, by the candle wax, which wind-worried drips into the candle wings, luminous and rare. By the illumination of that candle, exit death and fear and doubt. Here, love and possibility within a lit heart, shining out. Thank you. That was lovely, thank you. <laughs> Our next reader from the Department of Philosophy is Hannah Ginsberg. She's a professor in the philosophy department at Berkeley. Her a philosophical interest, these are, by the way, biography, biographical little sketches that the, the in individual readers are giving to us, and sometimes I like to embellish them, but sometimes I, I better watch out, that's true. Anyway, her interests include the philosophy of language and mind, as well as aesthetics and the philosophy of biology. She recently published a book of essays on Kant called The Normativity of Nature. She is an enthusiastic amateur pianist, which as I told her, our incoming university librarian also is. I know, this is good, and especially enjoys accompanying singers. Hannah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I had a lot of trouble <clears throat> finding a poem that would be suitable to read on this occasion. I wanted to find something that wasn't too familiar. I wanted to find something that wasn't too difficult to read because I'm not an experienced reader. And I also wanted to find something that would be reasonably accessible on a first hearing. And I ended up spending a lot of time just leafing through poetry collections in used bookstores and on friends' shelves. I must say, I really enjoyed that whole process. And then I found this poem uh, in the Penguin Book of Australian Verse, and I have no connection with Australia, and I'd never heard of this poet, but the poem, uh, I liked it. I found it touching. Uh, it's by Judith Wright, 
uh, and it was published in a collection of poems uh, that came out in around 1946. And it's called Brother and Sisters. The road turned out to be a cul-de-sac, stopped like a lost intention at the gate, and never crossed the mountains to the coast. But they stayed on. Years grew like grass and leaves across the half-erased and dubious track, until one day they knew the plans were lost, the blueprint for the bridge was out of date, and now their orchards never would be planted. The saplings sprouted slyly. Day by day, the bush moved one step nearer, wondering when. The polished parlor grew distray and haunted, where Millie, Lucy, John, each night at 10, wound the gilt clock that leaked the year away. The pianola, oh, listen to the mockingbird, wavers on Sundays and has lost a note. The wrinkled ewes snatch pansies through the fence and stare with shallow eyes into the garden, where Lucy shrivels waiting for a word and Millie's cameos loosen round her throat. The bush comes near, the ranges grow immense. Feeding the lambs deserted in early spring, Lucy looked up and saw the stockman's eye telling her she was cracked and old. The wall groans in the night and settles more awry. Oh, how they lie awake. Their thoughts go fluttering from room to room like moths. Millie, are you awake? Oh, John, I have been dreaming. Lucy, do you cry? Meet tentative as moths, antennae stroke a wing. There is nothing to be afraid of, nothing at all. The disadvantage I have is that Bob probably would know this poet, <laughs> even though he's probably five years old when the, the book was published, but uh, I do not. But that, that was actually charming. And I would say browsing books, this is a good thing. <laughs> the adjacency principle, look through books and you'll find other things. Thank you, that was lovely. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Lindsay Gottlieb, who is the uh, head coach of our women's basketball team, which has been quite successful, I would say. Yes. <laughs> there are a few of them here, I believe, that are keeping her on the, on the track here, that they need to, uh, she has places to go and things to do. Anyway, she is the head coach of Cal Women's Basketball. Since her first season in 2011-12, she's propelled the Golden Bears to unprecedented heights, including a top three finish in the Pac-12, an NC2A Women's Basketball Tournament berth in each of her four seasons here. She led the Bears to a Pac-12 championship, a Final Four appearance, and was voted the Pac-12 Coach of the Year by the media in 2012-13, um, and has guided four Cal players to the WNBA careers. And I'm gonna add one more thing. She started her career at Brown, and she went through the Orange at Syracuse, the Wildcats at New Hampshire, the Spiders at Richmond, and the Gauchos at UCSB, the Brown team is the Bears, and now she's back with the Golden Bears, so we'd like to welcome her to Lunch Poems. Lindsay. So the, the Brown Bear is my alma mater, so when people say, Cal people say, are you a bear? I say, of course I am. <laughs> Uh, I'm really excited to be here. A little disclaimer, I was walking up from Haas Pavilion, which is named after our Bob Haas. <laughs> I've met another Bob Haas here, but uh, I was talking to one of my assistants, because uh, some of my staff is here, and I said, you know, I speak in front of the media all the time, and people, and I never get nervous, and I'm really nervous for this. <laughs> then I walk in and see the company of readers, and hear the three million views thing, and I'm officially freaking out, so <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> um, I had a player a few years back. Um, her name was Talia Caldwell. Uh, she's a, a graduate of the Haas School of Business, and she was also a heck of a basketball player, so she's going to play some pro ball before she starts her, her next job. Um, but during one of our conversations uh, on a road trip the year before we went to the Final Four, very intellectual and um, interested in a lot of things, and so we were having a conversation, and she said to me, 
I bet you never knew before this what it was like to be black. And what she meant, of course, was that as a white coach of a predominantly African-American team, I was given a unique lens uh, or perspective into the black experience through the real life eyes of my players on this campus, in airports, um, really wherever we went. So in this current moment of, of social um, unrest um, and with the job that I see as a platform, uh, which I try to use um, to teach my players that their voices are extremely powerful. And with opportunities like this one, um, a super cool um, experience reading uh, poetry on this campus, um, I, I recognize that I have a voice as an ally um, and, and often a larger voice than some other people get. So what I decided to do uh, was call Talia Caldwell um, and ask, um, you know, how do I use my voice in this realm uh, to help share the perspective that you and your teammates have given me? Who should I read? So of course Talia says, oh, 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 rap is poetry and you have to do most deaf. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my research was maybe a little bit different um, than yours. Um, so most deaf is an American hip hop and rap artist. Uh, he is also an actor and an activist. Uh, he was the host of Deaf Poetry Jam on HBO, so one of, one of these artists kind of linking um, the two together and was listed as one of Source Magazine's top 50 lyricists of all time. So I will be reading Umi Says by Most Deaf. I will not be singing. I will not be rapping. I will be reading. Uh, and, and Umi is his, who he refers to as his mother. I don't want to write this down. I want to tell you how I feel right now. I don't want to take no time to write this down. I want to tell you how I feel right now. Tomorrow may never come for you or me. Life is not promised. Tomorrow may never show up for you and me. This life is not promised. I ain't no perfect man. I'm trying to do the best that I can with what it is I have. I ain't no perfect man. I'm trying to do the best that I can with what it is I have. Put my heart and soul into this song. I hope you feel me. From where I am to wherever you are, I mean that sincerely. Tomorrow may never come. For you and for me, life is not promised. Tomorrow may never appear. You better hold this moment very close to you. Very close to you. So close to you. So close to you. Don't be afraid to let it shine. Mayumi said, shine your light on the world. Shine your light for the world to see. Mayabi said, shine your light on the world. Shine your light for the world to see. Mayabi said, shine your light on the world. Shine your light for the world to see. Mayumi said, shine your light on the world. Shine your light for the world to see. Sometimes I get discouraged. I look around and things are so weak. People are so weak. Sometimes, sometimes I feel like crying. Sometimes my heart gets heavy. Sometimes I just want to leave and fly away. Sometimes I don't know what to do with myself. Passion takes over me. I feel like a man going insane, losing my brain, trying to maintain, doing my thing. Hey, 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 hey. Put my heart and soul into this, y'all. I hope you feel me. Where I am to wherever you are. Sometimes I don't want to be bothered. Sometimes I just want a quiet life with me and my babies, me and my lady. Sometimes I don't want to get into no war. Sometimes I don't want to be a soldier. Sometimes I just want to be a man. But Umi said, shine your light on the world. Shine your light for the world to see. Abi said, shine your light on the world. Shine your light for the world to see. I want black people to be free, to be free, to be free. All my people to be free, to be free, to be free. Oh, black people to be free, to be free, to be free. Oh, black people to be free, to be free, to be free. That's all that matters to me. That's all that matters to me. Black people unite and let's all get down. Gotta have what? Gotta have that love, peace, and understanding. One God, one light, one man, one voice, one mic. Black people unite, come on and do it right. Black people unite, come on and do it right. Black people unite, come on and get down. Gotta have what? Love, peace, and understanding. As Bob would say, wow. Does it? Thank you. That, that was wonderful. That was great. A wonderful perspective we get as we do these readings of people that sometimes we know or know of, and we learn a lot about them when we hear them read. So I think poetry needs to continue. Um, William Hanks is uh, the recipient of the 2015 Staley Prize. He's a linguist in, in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, whose undergraduate exposure to French poetry is intimately involved with where he has ended up. William. Very fast.
Well, I was told to go over there. Great. Thank you. Uh, and first of all, thank you uh, very much uh, for the invitation. I did consider uh, doing French and decided not to, because that is where I started. Uh, the poem that I want to share with you, <clears throat> I would say, uh, is an old friend uh, whom I revisit when I need to get new. A friend who is generous and wise of, uh, to life. It is almost for me like a prayer in which the reader becomes the eye of a sort of earthy credo. It came to me as a gift in my 20s when I was a graduate student in linguistics, desperately needing passion. Uh, and I must say that it has never lost its truth. To Earthward by Robert Frost. Love at the lips was touch as sweet as I could bear. And once that seemed too much, I lived on air that crossed me from sweet things. The flow of, was it musk from hidden grapevine springs downhill at dusk? I had the swirl and ache from sprays of honeysuckle that when they're gathered, shake dew on the knuckle. I craved strong sweets, but those seemed strong when I was young. The petal of the rose, it was that stung. Now no joy but lacks salt that is not dashed with pain and weariness and fault. I crave the stain of tears, the aftermath of almost too much love, the sweet of bitter bark and burning clove. When stiff and sore and scarred, I take away my hand from leaning on it hard in grass and sand. The hurt is not enough. I long for weight and strength to feel the, the earth as rough to all my length. Well, you can't beat Robert Frost. <laughs> and I'm sorry, again, Bob's not here because he would have something very poignant to say, which, was, which is lovely. Uh, now is the pitch for the library. You are in a library. It is a recreational library. It was opened in 1928, the Morrison Library. We have restored the portraits of Mrs. Morrison and her husband, Alexander Morrison, she uh, created this room in his memory. And we have President Campbell over there, a nice portrait who actually worked with Mrs. Morrison to make this possible. It's still here. It looks pretty much the same. And as we've discovered, some of these pieces of furniture are the same from 1928. So when we get around to the 100th anniversary of this place, I won't be here, but it's going to be a great celebration, too. But I, I thank you for joining us in this wonderful place. And so that we don't forget that the library plays a prominent role, we always like to have at least one librarian join us for this poetry reading. Lilidar Pensy, who is from the library, just I got to give you an introduction first here. <laughs> He knows a lot, I can tell you that. Joined the UC Berkeley Library in the fall of 2012. He serves currently as the librarian for Slavic, East European Studies, interim librarian for Classics, head of the International Exchanges for Collections. His doctorate is from UCLA, and uh, he's going to surprise you with his poem, Lovadar. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm a bit nervous because I had never done such a thing in life. And I must talk about holding the moment you mentioned and lighting the candles. They just struck me, and they're here in this poem also. It is not really a poem, it's a, it's a song, actually, uh, written in 1968 when Brazil was under military dictatorship by Geraldo Wandre. And the reason I bring myself to Brazil is when I was seven years old, I was traveling in the third class compartment of a train in India. And you know, in India, these vendors come with samosas and all these chais, and they want to sell you something. And my grandmother bought me a, a fruit called guava. And I said, oh, what a delicious guava. And my grandmother said, do you know, son, from where this come? This fruit comes? And I said, I, this is our Indian. Why are you telling me all these type of stories? No, it comes from Brazil. 
I said, where is Brazil? My father said, you will never go to Brazil. You will be in India. The first thing I did in 2006 when I was working at UCLA, when I got an opportunity to do research for my Latin American studies project, I went to Brazil. <laughs> and this song was playing on the, on the radio. And that was a sort of a peaceful revolution that intention, dreams, holding the moment, lighting the candles can happen to all of us in any moment. So I will read it. It's by Geraldo Andre, and I'm going to break from Anglophone tradition of this audience. I'm going to read it in Portuguese, if you don't mind. Para não dizer que não fale das flores. Just tra translating the title, so no as to tell you that I did not tell you about the flowers. Caminhando e cantando e seguindo a canção, somos todos iguais para os dados ou não, nas escolas, nas ruas, campos, construções, caminhando e cantando e seguindo a canção. Vem, vamos embora, que esperar não é saber, quem sabe faz a hora, não espera acontecer. Pelo campos a fome, em grandes plantações, pelas ruas, marchando em decisos, em decisos cardões. Ainda fazem da flor seu mais forte refrão e acreditam nas flores vencendo a canhão. Vem, vamos embora, que espera não é saber, que sabe faz a hora, não espera acontecer. A soldados armados, armados ou não, Quase todos perdidos de armas na mão. No cartaz, eles ensinam uma antiga lição de morrer pela pátria e viver sem razão. Vem, vamos embora, que espera não é saber. Quem sabe faz a hora, não espera acontecer. Nas escolas, nas ruas, campos, construções, somos todos soldados armados ou não. Caminhando e cantando e seguindo a canção, somos todos iguais, braços, braços dados ou não. Os amores na mente, na flores no chão, a certeza na frente, a história na mão, caminhando e cantando e seguindo a canção, aprendendo e ensinando uma nova lição. Vem, vamos embora, que espera não é saber, quem sabe faz a hora, não espera acontecer. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I would like to thank everyone. I'm going to let Katie wrap it up because she, she can say, say it again. But I would like to do a little lovely parting gifts. This is, this is good, see? It's a bookmark that's a little different, which you get in a library. But it's also one of those little shopping bags you can keep with you at all times that's branded with the library on it so you'll remember us. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, so that concludes our kickoff reading. Thank you so much for attending. Um, as I mentioned before, the next reading is October 1st, same time, and it will be featuring John Shop Talk. Thank you.